Father, we thank you. We praise you for this day, the day that you created in eternity and brought forth in time so that you might be a blessing to your people. We thank you, God, for touching these bodies, making them whole, complete, and lacking nothing. Thank you for establishing us in a right mind. Open our hearts to receive one another. And God, we thank you for the love of Christ who left his post in heaven, come down to earth to give his life for a ransom for you and I. God, we thank you. Thank you now, God for your kingdom appearing in this place as your people are worshiping your presence. Thank you for these and all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. Well, if you have your Bibles, Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12. I want to read verses 7 and 8 today. We're, we're talking about the gifts, and I'm trying to do one or two a day so that we don't get overwhelmed. Is that all right? Amen. So Romans 12, 7 says, or ministry, let us use our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, and he who gives, ooh, I like this part, with liberality. He who leads with diligence, and he who so shows mercy with cheerfulness. Today we want to talk about teaching, exhorting, and sharing. Teaching, exhorting, and sharing. There's a math method to that process. People who teach should then exhort people to do what they're taught, which should result in sharing. You can be seated. You can be seated. Good to see y'all made it this morning, those of you who did. Amen. People who are late, you know what that means, right? They had no expectation of waking up this morning because they, <laughs> they made no arrangements for this extra hour, right? Oh, y'all didn't. <laughs> No, what I'm saying is if you, if you knew that, that that time was going to change, you should have fixed that last night. Amen. But I'm talking to the wrong crowd because y'all here. Yeah. <laughs> well, you tell them I said so. All right. Before I get into the teaching, exhorting, and sharing, I want to remind you of what uh, Paul has said about this uh, in Romans. He's, he's talking about all the gifts. And we said that gifts, the gifts, the Bible says, uh, is grace gifts. The Bible says that the gifts are charismata. That's what that means, gifts, charismata. But he says that what he gives us then is, is given to us by his grace. And it's given to us for a specific purpose. We are reminded that we are part of one body, one body. And the Bible says because of that, uh, we all have gifts. Everybody in the room has gifts. The Bible says that the gifts vary among us. In other words, they're different gifts. That's why verse 6 says, then having gifts differing. So what he's talking about is diversity to create unity. Then he said the third thing here is all gifts come from God. We understand that if we have a gift, that God was the originator of that gift, <clears throat> excuse me. But we need to remember also that these gifts are given for specific purposes. You don't get a gift just so you can be good at what, what you do. The gift is to bless someone. Amen. Now can I tell you one thing, and, and, and I'm gonna move a little quicker, because I want you to get this in your spirits. When you receive a gift, the gift is not for you. 
The gift is to flow through you. Now, the best way I can explain this so it makes sense to all of us, uh, if the gift is money, then the gift is not for you. <laughs> it is to flow. Now, let me try it on the other side, because y'all, I know it's early. I understand. Amen. You having a coffee? Or you? If you have money in your pocket and you have needs, but you don't release the money to meet the needs, then the money, watch this, is of no value. Money gets its value from its use. Amen. So if your gift then is money, you all with me? The other thing about gifts is this, is that in order for a gift to be used and to be used effectively, you don't have to have an office to use it in. Now, this is where we get into real serious trouble because people have a tendency to believe that if you can prophesy, you will profit. Amen. The truth is, if you can talk, you can prophesy. But you don't necessarily have to have the office of a prophet to do that. Amen. I can prophesy to you that in the year uh, 2033, you're going to be 10 years old. <laughs> now check me out. <laughs> but what I can tell you with a certainty is that even though you have gifts and all gifts are from God and all gifts are not the same, Oh, here's the part that I might need to take a minute with. You have to be careful that you don't name your gift. Hmm? There's a thing about naming. I was looking up this morning. It, it just it dropped in my spirit. There's a thing about naming. You know, the Bible says that in Genesis chapter 2, and Adam, and let's call him, for the sake of understanding what I'm about to tell you, let's call him Pastor Adam. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And God said to Pastor Adam, uh, call these things whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says that in Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 and 19, that whatever Adam called them, mm -hmm. that was their name. OK. Mm -hmm. So then we go into the New Testament so we can understand the process of naming. You know, in Genesis chapter uh, 17, uh, God changed Abraham's name. Genesis chapter 32, he changed Jacob's name. And why did he change their names? Because the name has to fit the function, but mm -hmm. the name has to come from authority. So when you go to 1 Corinthians, he talks about the makeup of the church. And he said the pastor, the set man of the house, God says he set in church what he needed. So he establishes in church what he needs in the church. Amen. So if I call you a uh, deacon and you say, I don't want to be a deacon. I want to be uh, a pastor. You don't have that authority. Because if that's the case. You have to find another house because. <laughs> that job's already taken. Amen. 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 Now, yeah, I, no, <laughs> you're laughing and you think I'm, I'm just making fun. But listen to what I'm saying to you. Somebody has to recognize the call in you. You don't wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm going to be president of this United States and then go try to. Well, some people did try that, didn't they? 
Uh, <laughs> but normally, <laughs> people don't do that. You can't be a self-appointed whatever. Whether it's a prophet, whether it's a minister, whether it's the gifts we're talking about, the teaching, the exhorting, the sharing, you don't appoint yourself to do that. The, the call comes from without. You can know that you have it, but it still must be confirmed without. Amen. Amen. We got this? That's why so many people are in the wrong place. Because you decided what you thought you should be. And then you went about doing what you thought that gift ought to be. Amen. 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 That's why when you get a beautiful voice and you sing like an angel, the first thing you do is go on tour. Amen. But the gift is for what? Right? See, some people got it. For the house. I got two, mil two or three illustrations, but all of them are bad. I mean, they're good for me. <laughs> bad. <laughs> so maybe I just move on. How about that? But you all understand where I'm coming from? Yes. Don't decide uh, uh, preemptively that you are going to be this, that, or the other, and then you come to me and say, Pastor, I think the Lord has called me to be the pastor because... <laughs> I'm going to tell you there's going to be a serious misunderstanding. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. And what we have here is a failure to communicate. <laughs> now, two things, two more things before I get to these. In Romans chapter 12, verse 3 and verse uh, 6, the Bible teaches us, uh, uh, and, and I think this is important for us to remember, that these, these uh, gifts relate to the faith that we have. The gifts and the faith are related. The Bible says that uh, each one is given a gift and then it's, everyone is given a measure of faith to operate the gift. So there's a, a measure of faith to operate the gift. Now, watch this. If there's no operating of the gift, you don't have any faith. You can't do what you were called to do because you're not doing anything. Amen. Amen. And when you have the gift and you recognize the gift and you use the gift, you still use the gift in proportion to your faith. Amen. What does that mean? That means that uh, if we, that's the last one we're going to talk about today. Let's talk about giving for, for just, just for a minute. <clears throat> if I have that gift, that gift is magnified when my faith is magnified because my giving increases. Yeah. Yeah. And watch this. So what happens, and I'm going to get to it somewhere today, but, but here's what happens. If I have that gift, if I have the gift of giving, God will supernaturally cause me to have more. Because he knows he can trust me with more. Are you with me? But let me go back to what I'm supposed to be teaching. I just make sure that we know that the gift is in proportion to your faith. And you got to have faith to operate the gift. And the faith, uh, the gift comes from God. Now, 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 we, this is a big supposition. You might need to know that uh, uh, none of these gifts work outside of Christ. Now, they will work, but let me tell you, I, when I say they don't work outside of Christ, every gift and calling is without repentance. But you can pervert the gift and mess up a whole lot of people. Mm -hmm. For example, let's go back to prophesying. Your prophesying works if it's not submitted, then it becomes prophesying. 
Because you're still going to say stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if we go back to the giving, if you prefer it, you can have the gift of giving, but be stingy as all get out. So the gift's not working because you hadn't released anything. OK, so I guess what I was trying to say at the beginning is that the first thing you need when we say faith to operate the gift, you need faith in God. And, and maybe that's what I should have told you to begin with, that you must be saved. You must be born again in order for it. <laughs> but, that, you know, that, I'm just assuming that you knew that, but uh, I can't be making assumptions. OK. All right. So then. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, it says, but one and the same spirit works all these things. Here it is distributing to each one individually. How? As he wills. And the he is capitalized, meaning the he is not me. Now, here's the thing. As a pastor, I'm astute enough to know what gifts we have in the body. Amen. Are, are y'all with me? Amen. But because I call you to do that doesn't mean that you will. Amen. You may say, I mean, that's too hard. I ain't got time for that. Now, that gift is necessary for the body. Yes. Amen. So you have it, you're holding it, and two things happen with that. It doesn't work for you, and it hinders the person who could be doing it. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? So you block somebody because you're not doing anything. Okay. All these looks of wonderment. What in the world is he talking about? Well, let me put it this way. In verse three of this, this right here, it says that you ought to think uh, soberly mm -hmm. as, God has dealt, as God has dealt you to measure of faith. You can't think more highly of yourself because you do have a gift. Amen. Mm -hmm. Because the gift came from God and it's to be submitted to the body. All right, let's talk about teaching. I, yeah, yeah, I, I had to get you settled. Now, the teacher, now the, the Greek word didasko, you don't need to remember that. Uh, it's a person whose office or gift uh, is to instruct others or simply explaining the truth of Christianity. The teacher ought to be able to tell you exactly what's what when it comes to the scripture. Uh, teaching in the Old Testament was obviously a, an honored profession, but in the New Testament, teaching was probably limited to moral behavior. All right? You're trying to figure out what moral behavior is? It's the should nots. Or in our neighborhood, the ought nots. <clears throat> You ought not to do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, Paul says this, And God appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers after that, miracles then, gifts of healing, helps, administrations, variety of tongues. Uh, two things I want you to see. Uh, first, the Bible says that Teaching is a good gift because it's right behind. You see where it's rated? Uh, rated? Right behind the apostles and the prophets. Mm -hmm. The other thing I need you to see is that the last on the list is what? The one that you like the best. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the Bible says in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2, is what it says. It says a bishop must be blameless, husband of one wife, temperate, sober, sober minded. 
Mm. I don't know why I separated those. Uh, of good behavior, hospitable, and what? Able to teach. Now, the Bible didn't make a mistake. It didn't say able to preach. <clears throat> because, Amen. you know. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22 says, And the things which you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these things to faithful men who are what? Able to teach others also. <clears throat> a teacher must be able to communicate in such a way that the information that they uh, transmit is received and passed on. Amen. 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 You remember some years ago I taught you. Um, yeah, I knew right there when I said some years ago. <laughs> Anybody remember the Burlo model, model of communication? Okay, all right. Well, I can't use that if you don't remember it. But any, it, <laughs> any form of communication has to have several parts to it. So let me do it this way. In order for you to transmit a message to me, there must first of all be what we call conceptualization. Amen. By conceptualization, it means I got to form a thought in my head what I want to say. Amen. You know this is the kind of thing you do when you're getting mad with somebody. Amen. Huh? Amen. You got to get it right in your head. Because I don't want to go too far, but I want to go, gee, you know. <laughs> and then uh, uh, after I have the idea in my head, I have to, to put it in some kind of code that, that everybody can understand. In our case, it's English. And then we transmit it. The receiver on the other end has got to be able to speak English in order for them Mm -hmm. They receive it, translate it, and, and then there's one last part to it. Now, this part is different than what Paul is talking about. Communication has not taken place. It's not effective. It's not complete unless there is feedback. Amen. Amen. So that's the missing link. If there's no feedback, then you don't know that you communicated. Hmm? If I say close the door, <laughs> close the door, huh? And you open the refrigerator, <laughs> then we have a problem. So a teacher must be able to communicate in such a way that there's feedback. You know that what you get. Now in school, you know, they have a way of doing that. It's called testing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The world has a system called testing, too. Mm -hmm. It's called corrections. Uh, <laughs> it should change it to the Department of Misunderstood. Come on. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good. I mean. Teachers differ. <laughs> teachers differ from prophets in the sense that teachers explain the traditional Bible truths while prophets give specific messages from God. Now, here's the problem with the two offices or the two gifts is that if a prophet tells you something, you can't ask the teacher what it means. Did you, did, 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 okay, let me try. If the prophet gives you something, then that's a word from God. It didn't come from me. It came from God. So if you don't understand it, you can't come to the pastor or the teacher to explain to you what the prophet said, because if it came from God, you should go to God. Oh, look at that. That's what you call teaching right there. <laughs> uh, 
Now, the Bible says this also. <laughs> Y'all are really good today. I'll tell you that out. Maybe we should start church a little. <laughs> you're getting that one amen. You gave me a laugh, but you didn't give me that. <laughs> the word of God not only needs to be proclaimed by the prophet, but it has to be explained by the teacher. Now, any word that's in this Bible, I can explain it to you. Amen. Might not be today. <laughs> and the reason I tell you that is because some people are so quick to give an answer off the top of their head. Uh, no, I got to figure this thing out. Teaching provides guidance for what people ought to do. You know how. How. Uh, the old preacher used to always say, you got to live right. But you can't live right unless you have teaching. You don't just automatically how to behave right. Can I? Okay. So many side roads today. One of the problems we have today is that we live in a society that keeps moving the line. Yes. As, a, as a nation, as a world, we have an issue with what is right and wrong. We sometimes blur the lines and it gets us in trouble. The problem is, is that the Bible hasn't changed. Lying is still a sin. Huh? You, you understand what I'm saying? Some things are absolutes. Yes. But now uh, we have things that we call plausible deniability. <laughs> huh? Well, I'm going to leave out this part so I can tell you, well, yeah, but I didn't say that. But you inferred. You, you understand what I'm saying? So we do a lot of that today. And now what we've, we, we've seen is, oh, society is now deciding what's morally right. Yes. Amen. And society has never been given that authority. Yes. <laughs> Bec oh, God. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the real problem is that Human beings abdicated their moral integrity for the sake of allowing the government to do it. So we have to make laws to keep you from doing stupid stuff. I'm not calling anybody stupid, so don't, don't be. So now we have to tell you, put your seatbelt on. Why? So you don't get killed. Well, amen. I don't want nobody telling me how to live. Go for it. But you understand what I'm saying? So the more society moves, and I got to get off of this, the more society moves in one direction, the more we move the laws to accommodate society when it should be the other way around. All law in this country, United States of America, is the result of ecclesiastical law. Your moral code came from the church. And that's where it should end, right here. Okay, moving on, moving on. Whew. So I said teaching... <laughs> Provides guidance for what people ought to do, but encouragement helps them achieve it. That's why these two gifts are uh, 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 right next to each other. See, if you teach someone, you give them the information, then you still should encourage them to apply the information. But I'm going to get to encouragement in just a moment. The Bible says that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it says that teaching differs from prophecy in that it instructs the mind. That's what teaching does. It instructs your mind. But the Bible says that prophecy addresses your heart and your will. It's how I feel about what 
the Lord is saying. Amen. Don't y'all love that? Well, that's not how it's supposed to work. Yeah, I know that. But that's exactly what you do. You, you feel it. Well, I ain't feeling that. <laughs> Te <laughs> Teaching is more concerned with knowledge. Prophecy is more with revelation. Now, here's what the Bible says. Today, you have something that the prophet didn't have. A Bible. He's getting it directly from God, giving it to you. Now you have a Bible. You can read it. You can have someone to come in and explain it to you. Huh? Amen. Look at this. Second uh, Thessalonians chapter two, verse 15. It says, therefore, brethren, stand fast. Hold the tradition which you were taught, <clears throat> whether by word or our epistle. Mm -hmm. Now, see, before there was no epistle. Amen. Second Timothy chapter one, verse 13 says, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you've heard from me in faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. Now, I can talk to you all day, but if you don't believe what I'm saying and you haven't applied faith to the word, you still won't know anything when I finish talking. That's why people leave church happy and then the devil meets them at the door. And they have, have no clue what to do when they run into it. Amen? Amen. And then, last point on this, and then I'm going to move on. I, I got to move on quick. Acts chapter 18, verse 26. And uh, they're going to put it up, but I'm not going to read it to you because I'm going to tell you the story. Uh, in Acts chapter 18, <clears throat> uh, Apollos was preaching in, at Ephesus. And, 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 you know, if you can read the whole context, you'll find that he was a good preacher. He was throwing down, as they would say. He was a good preacher. The problem is he didn't have all the information because all he understood was John's baptism. He didn't understand that the Holy Spirit had already come and that it had already fallen on the people and that uh, they, the people, had received the gift of the Spirit and that they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. So they had knowledge uh, that Apollos didn't have. Amen. Amen. Hmm? Now, what am I saying to you? I'm saying that as saints of God, you can be sincere and be Sincerely wrong. Amen. Amen. You understand this? Now, let me tell you why this is a problem, because uh, some Christians are so dogmatic about what they believe that they won't move off their stand. They are always preaching where God was rather than where God is. And because when you're preaching where he was, you people who have moved on will know that you're wrong. Now, in this case, uh, Aquila and Priscilla were in the audience and they said, oh, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Now, watch this. They were very, very cool in what they did. Mm -hmm. They called Apollos to the side mm -hmm. and said, hey, let me. Amen. You know how we said, let me pull your coat, bro. <laughs> Amen. And they explained this to him. Now, last week. I made this great grand gesture of telling you all about Mary, yeah. huh? Yeah. Trying to lift up women. Uh -huh. you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Huh? And you all just kind of went, huh? <laughs> So I'm going to take another shot. Aquila uh, and Priscilla. That's not the order, is it? What does the Bible call it? Priscilla and Aquila. That is amazing. Now, I'm looking at the screen in the King James Version. I mean, know that in the, uh, excuse me, New King James, in the King James, it's always Priscilla 
and Aquila. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to know why, go to Romans chapter 16. All right. I'm going to give you this one, but act like you appreciate it. <laughs> Romans chapter 16. Are you there? Yeah. Bible says, greet. Verse three. Okay. Greet Priscilla and Aquila. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? Amen. It goes on to say, watch this. My fellow workers in Christ Jesus who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give, I give thanks, but also to the churches of the Gentiles. Watch this. Likewise, we greet the church that is where? In their mm. Now, why is Priscilla mentioned first? Because she's the pastor. So you got it this week, huh? So, <laughs> Y'all so cute. I tell you, I tell you. Woo. So what I'm saying to you is that um, even though the Southern Baptist Convention does not believe <laughs> Believe in women preachers. <laughs> Apparently, Paul does. Amen. Are y'all still with me? Amen. Okay. Let's move on to exhortation. I see right now. <laughs> so the gift of exhortation, the, the word there uh, is a familiar word to all of us, paraclesis. Say, no, it ain't. Okay. All right. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is called the paraclete. Paraclesis means to be called alongside. Okay? <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> so now that ain't familiar to me. I don't know where you got that from. The Bible says this person uh, admonished the unruly and disorderly. And it supported the weak and they comfort uh, penitents and those who were under heaviness. Now, <laughs> under heaviness talks about being under many temptations. I don't have time to get into it today, but let me just say this. People are weighted because of what's going on inside of them not what's going on outside. Amen. Amen. Do you understand? Huh? Okay. All right. I'll, that's for another message. Okay. So the Bible says the root word is to come alongside and encourage, but it's used to excite people. Uh, and it, it has nothing to do with church. Now. Let's, let's just change the word then. Let's call it coaching. Amen. Hmm? That's how we coach up people. Amen. If you tell a player after every play, you suck. He ain't going to play very well. But if you tell him what to do, it's. Let me, let me tell you my little thing I do with Katie all the time because it works. I tell Katie all the time, we don't get upset. We fix things. Amen. Amen. And that's what we do. We don't get upset. We fix things. If there's a problem, we fix it. We don't get upset. Amen. Hmm? And see, good coaching says, okay, that was then. This is now. Let's move on to the next play. Amen. Amen. And it's the same way with an exhorter. You have to tell people. OK, this is what the Bible says. This is how you live the Christian life. Yeah. This is what's necessary to be successful in it. And if they don't make that play, then what do you do? You come back and coach them up for the next one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that it's also 
comfort and consolation. But it's not restricted to just that. It is also warning people. Amen. 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 So you tell the quarterback, OK, you got to watch your blind side. Because if you don't, <laughs> this young, hungry <laughs> linebacker is coming. <laughs> Amen. So you, you have to warn, this is what you need to be aware of. Huh? Now, one of the most difficult things with Christians is trying to tell them what to be aware of. One of the most different things with Christians is what to tell them what to be aware of. One of the most different, uh, difficult things <laughs> for Christians is to tell them that they need to be aware of something. Because the very thing you tell them, watch out for this. Let me see. And unfortunately, most of us don't understand that God wouldn't give us information or revelation if you're not going to do anything with it. Amen. Huh? The Bible says this gift is to stir or make a people uh, make a decision for Christ so that we can grow so they can grow up in it. See, if you're a good Christian, you ought to have such a happy outlook on life. You should have your countenance up all the time. You should have the joy of the Lord working in you everywhere you go so that people would want to be you. Amen. 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 The Bible says in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy <clears throat> uh, chapter 2, uh, excuse me, verse, chapter 4, verse 2, Timothy says, it says, preach the word, be ready in season, outside, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, which means there's some work involved in it. Amen. And in Hebrews chapter three, verse 13 says this, but exhort one another daily. Oh, my God. How often? Daily. Amen. And some people have, I don't call it. Uh, well, I do call it, too. I might as well. <laughs> some people have what we call a slow disposition. They just don't do much of anything right away. Yeah. They're not, they're not rebellious. They won't fight with you. It's just that. Yeah, I know. You, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I know you're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a lot of people like that. Every day, you got to prop them up, get them out of bed. But it's raining in the house. Huh? Huh? <laughs> so he says, exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now, if you don't get up in the morning, the chance of you doing anything in the afternoon is slim to none. Amen. <laughs> so get up and get going. Hmm? I like to get up in the morning and just have a cup of coffee Amen. or two or three. And you know what? Here's, here's the option I have. If I want to go back to bed, That's right. I can go back. Amen. But when I'm up, I find it hard. Amen. You know, unless I'm not feeling well, it's hard to get back into bed. Uh, I got, is, this, is this the right group? It ain't hard for me. I, I can get, a, get right back into bed and cover myself up. Yeah. You know how tired you are if you stay in bed all day? Oh, my God. And then you walk around complaining, oh, my back hurts. I don't know why my neck is hurt. Because you stayed in bed all day. Uh, 
Okay, I'm looking at the clock. I won't be able to do much on giving, but uh, I do want to hit on it just a, a bit, okay? The gift of giving is called metadiam, uh, excuse me, metadiam, diomai. Now, when we talk about metadiomai, we're talking about the gift of giving, not, not the, the act of giving, but the gift of giving. It simply means the giving or sharing of one's earthly possessions, such as money, clothing, food. Hmm? Now, this is the only gift that has a caveat. Watch what it says. All right. Uh, let me find it. It says here. Who gives and then here's the caveat. How? With liberality. Amen. It's the only gift that tells you how to use it. Amen. Say what? It's the only gift that tells you how to use it. Now, here's how you know whether you have this gift or not. And I'm going to tell you more about the gift next week. But here's what I want you to know. The way that you know whether you have this gift or not is that you do it liberally. The other word the Bible uses is called simplicity. Simplicity. What does simple, uh, simplicity mean? It means singleness of mind, singleness of purpose. When I give, I have one goal in mind to be a blessing. Period. Amen. All right, I'm going to stop right here because I'm out of time, but I'm going to pick it up right here next week. So stand up on your feet. The Bible says we teach and exhort people so they can release the gift. We are able to give because we have been taught and we have been encouraged to do this. There's a scripture in the Bible that uh, a lot of people have a tendency to hang their hats on. It says that the Holy Spirit is our teacher and that we don't need to be taught because he's our teacher. Uh, and that's one of those sincerely wrong kind of things. He is our teacher, but he is not your teacher in the spirit. He's your teacher in the flesh where the teacher is inspired by the Holy Spirit to give you information. There's an old saying that a person what is it? A lawyer who represents himself has a fool for a client. If you think that you are self-taught, how do you verify your teaching? Ask yourself. This is why you need teachers. You need someone to lead you in the truth of Scripture. This is impossible unless you have a relationship with Christ. So before we pray, let me say this. If you don't have a personal relationship with Christ, uh, it would be my privilege to lead you into his presence. Having a personal relationship with Christ means that not only uh, do I pray and get an answer, but I have people who are sent in my path to give me guidance to where I need to go and what I need to do. So if you don't have a spiritual tour guide, I want to make sure that we give you one today. If I'm talking to you, you can step out of your seat right now and we'll take care of you. Now, if the house is saved and everybody believes that Jesus is Lord of your life. I just want to affirm then, everybody needs somebody. Yes. There are no long ranges. Yes. We must have help in this walk. Yes. So I want to agree with you this morning. 
that God will release that person in your life that can give you wise counsel and lead you into his truth. At this moment, we want to extend you the same opportunity that's been extended to those in the sanctuary today, and that's to receive Christ as your personal Savior. If you have not yet made that decision, if you have not yet accept, accepted him as your personal Savior, or maybe you have at some point in your life and you went a little to the left, we've all been there before, and now you want to return back and get this thing right, this is your opportunity right now. It's as simple as ABC. First, admit that you're a sinner. Secondly, believe Christ died for your sins. And thirdly, confess that he is Lord over your life. If I'm talking to you, if this is you, I want you to join me in this very, very simple prayer. All you have to do is repeat after me, okay? Let's do it. Here we go. Say, Father, I thank you for this opportunity of forgiveness. I have sinned. I have fallen short. Lord, I ask that you would forgive me of all of my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord, for sending your son Jesus to die for me. Thank you, Lord, that he rose with all power in his hand. And so now I confess with my mouth what I believe in my heart, that when Jesus was raised from the dead, I am saved. Thank you, Lord, for saving me in Jesus name. Amen. Listen, we are so excited. You have made the single greatest decision that you could ever make in your life. Welcome home, family. The angels in heaven are rejoicing and throwing a block party in your honor right now, this very moment, because we have acquired a new kingdom citizen or another kingdom citizen has returned home. We are so proud of you. We could not be more proud of you. Listen, if you prayed that prayer with us today, if you would, please do us a favor. Text the word SAVED to 252-627-9900. We're not trying to spam you. We, wanna want, we don't wanna bug you, but what we want to do is connect with you and pray with you. We wanna share a devotional with you to help solidify this faith walk that you were embarking on. So again, text the word SAVED to 252-627-9900 so we can connect with you. Listen, the Bible says it's not good for man to be alone. We usually equate that scripture to marriage, but no, we're talking about this faith journey. It's not good to be alone. Jesus went out and got the 12 disciples to gather people around him because he knew it was not good to be alone. So we don't want you to be alone. We want to be your community. We want to partner with you. We want to pray with you and for you as you uh, com continue to move forward on this faith journey listen if you're in the area come check us out in here in New Bern if you're not let us know we'll help you find a church that suits you in the area that you're in and hey if you come check us out and you're like yeah this ain't really for me let us know that too we have no problem in that because we're not trying to grow a church we're trying to grow the church and we will help you connect with another church in this area that may suit your needs a little better listen we ain't got no pride we ain't got no mm -mm. we want to see everybody win we want to see everybody make it into the kingdom of heaven okay listen we are so proud of you once again thank you thank you thank you thank you for making the single greatest decision that you could ever possibly make in your life i promise you you won't regret it all right, guys, listen, my time is up. I got to get out of here, but I pray that you guys have an amazing week. And just in case your week is not so amazing, we pray that it has an amazing you in it. All right. Until we get together again, God bless you. We love you. And we can't wait to see you next time.